Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another rendition of the BH virtual event space. I am very happy to welcome back to the event space, Dr. Sagay. How are you doing today? Good, good. How are you? It's great to be back. It's it's wonderful thank to you have you back. Me. It's wonderful. You know, it's it's been, I think, a whole month. So we've we've been having a little bit of like you know uh, of withdrawal from seeing you. <laughs> no, you're exaggerating. I think last time was uh, maybe late late May. So, late but May. You, okay. yeah, you're not you're not too far off. It and, feels but, like you know, it feels I, like just yesterday. That's the thing. I can't get enough of BNH. You know, I gotta I gotta be back. <laughs> there you go. And well, well, the feeling is mutual. We can't get enough of Dotan. So the great news is he's back, he's here, he's ready more than ever, and he's actually talking about the game plan today. So he's talking about the street photography game plan to be exact. So if you want to get a little insight into how Dotan works and how he sets up his workflow and everything like that, that's what we're going to be breaking down today. So hope you got your pen and paper ready and you know excited. Anybody who's joining us on Zoom, please feel free to use the Q&A tab on there to ask Dotan any questions you may have. We'll hold those towards the end and get to them as they come in. Same thing for live stream and Facebook. We definitely welcome those questions as well on the comments section. Please feel free to ask him, you know, anything about his workflow. Don't ask him, you know, if, if he wants to, you know, take you out for the day and, you know, shoot with you. He might be busy, but, <laughs> but you can always throw it out there and maybe, maybe he's got a free day and he's willing to work with you. But otherwise, without any further ado, Dotan, take it away. The floor is yours and I'll see you in a little bit. Awesome. Thank you. So, uh, well, my name is Dotan Sagi. Um, I'm a street photographer, documentary photographer. I don't know. I keep uh, doing new stuff. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles and in Mammoth Lakes these days. Also, I work in the Eastern Sierra. I got a couple projects up in the mountains these days. Um, and um, I uh, published a couple of books that some of you may know uh, by the excellent publisher Kara Verlag. And uh, the first one, Venice Beach, was published in 2018. The second one, Nowhere to Go But Everywhere, published in 2020, right spank in the middle of the pandemic, perfect for a new book. <laughs> uh, and, um, and if you're quick, there actually are still some, a few copies of each out. There's a second edition of Venice Beach that's, uh, that's still out. And the first edition of uh, Nowhere to Go But Everywhere is uh, they're on Amazon and in bookstores and so, so on. I'm also like an academy instructor and I run an online uh, street photography masterclass and we'll talk more about those later. So today I want to talk about the game plan um, as we talked about in, in the intro and why are we talking about a game plan? Uh, isn't street photography supposed to be this spontaneous, you know, free thing that you just go in the street and do, and that you can practice anywhere and at any time with any camera? And so today I'm going to play a little bit of the devil's advocate on, on, on this, you know, kind of myth uh, of, you know, of this kind of free and spontaneous thing. And my contention in there is that uh, it depends that, but it, it, it all depends what you want out of it. And I, you know, as you'll, as you might know, I, I come from a career in high tech and um, I've kind of taken with me a lot of the, you know, methodology and, and, and thinking from that and applied it to photography. So today um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how I, I put all this stuff into a method. Uh, but it, just to, to kind of clarify, if your priority, you know, it's not everybody's priority to, to, to get the most out of their street photography in terms of results. You know, for a lot of people, it's very experiential. It might be, you know, something they do, you know, just on a spare time to, to, to decompress and have fun and, and they don't want the pressure of producing. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, today, I just to clarify who this is, you know, most oriented towards uh, what I'm going to talk about. You know, if you're enjoying a nice walk in your neighborhood and, and you want to only go out at convenient times and you, you like playing with gear, cameras and lenses and stuff, and you want to hang out with photographer friends and go shoot together. Well, you may not need a game plan. I mean, this is, you know, it's more of a social thing and a fun thing. And, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, what I want to talk about today is if you want to make the best possible images and, and that's what you prioritize, you really want results out of your street photography, then, then this presentation is really for you. Um, so that's, that's uh, just to kind of introduce what we're going to talk about. 
Um, so in, in terms of you know what separates the two, those two kinds of photographers, people who are do, doing it more you know for a social thing or, or to play with gear and so on or to decompress, um, the difference between those photographers and the ones who are really you know uh, using a methodology is that you know both can make great photographs. I think you know both both kinds of photographers make great photographs every now and then, regardless. The difference is that uh, people who have a game plan can really consistently deliver great images. And that's really the difference, you know? And, and I, to be honest, before I got really serious with photography and street photography, we're talking like 10 years back or, or more, um, I was more of the first kind of photographer. And I was, you know, every now and then I would get a, a, an image that I was proud of, um, but it wasn't super consistent. And it's really when I started applying this methodology that I'm gonna talk about, that I started really getting consistently, you know, good images that I could publish and, and you know, do stuff with. So uh, it's not a question of luck or being a genius or anything like that. It's really, as far as I'm concerned, it's about having that game plan. Uh, so what do I mean by having a game plan? I know I've been like tossing around that this kind of buzzword. Uh, what I mean is really, um, it's all about being deliberate. It's about being strategic. It's about being methodical. Um, it's about, putting the best chances on your side at every step of the process. And we'll go through the steps of the process. And that's what we're going to kind of clarify today. Um, you know, like I said, I come from high tech. So it's a competitive space in high tech and it's full of smart people. And, and really that's the inspiration for, for this game plan. You know, that's kind of what I brought to, to photography. Um, if you just didn't know where to look for, you know, that kind of a, a game plan or, or, you know, a methodology, you would look in, in books. I mean, that's the first thing I would do personally. <clears throat> Sorry. It's the first thing I would, I would look at is, you know, I would go on Amazon or in a bookstore and look for books. And unfortunately, these days, I mean, I'm just going to throw on the screen a, a few examples. These are some of the kind of most recent <clears throat> street photography books to come out. They're great, by the way. I have them. I, I, I've read them. They, they provide, they're great at providing encouragement. They're great at providing inspiration. Uh, they have a whole bunch of helpful, helpful tips. But one thing they don't have, in my experience anyway, is they don't have a method, a clear methodology that you can follow from A to Z. You know, this is what you do when you go in the street, and this is how you shoot street. They're how-to books, but somehow they don't really give you the full how-to. And it's not just me saying that. If you actually listen to the authors, uh, you know, in this case, you know, David Gibson, the, the author of this book, I think it's in the um, conclusion, and he says something like, "You cannot realistically teach students to make meaningful photographs because ultimately everybody has to be self-taught." That's actually a, a quote from that book. And I found, you know, when I got to that sense, I was like, that's pretty ironic because it's a how-to book about street photography that says it, it's even says it's a manual. Uh, so I personally disagree. And I think you can teach people to make meaningful photographs, street photographs, but you have to have a method, not just tips and, and encouragements. Although both are good. I'm not saying those are bad. I'm just saying you need a method on top of that. So... Today, I'll share my, my own method. You know, I'm not saying it's the only thing that works. I'm just saying that's what works for me. There's many different ways of, of shooting street. So don't, you know, don't take it as this is the only end all be all of shooting street. It's just how I work. And um, we'll look at how I prepare for a shoot, what I do once I'm on location, and then what I do after, um, I, after I shoot. So first, let's talk about gear. And I know that's a sensitive topic because we all love our gear and we, we all, uh, you know, think very, uh, you know, we have strong uh, ideas and, and uh, beliefs about gear. So, but bear in mind here, again, this is my method and I'm, I'm optimizing for productivity. What I want is not necessarily hanging out with friends or, or enjoying my afternoon, I want results. And, and so, what I want out of my gear, actually, I don't know if anybody can, can guess this. I know we can't hear you guys, but um, I'm, I'm curious what, what would people have in mind? Like, what would you optimize for when you choose gear? Uh, personally, what the number one thing for me is I want my gear to stay out of the way. That's, what, that's the first thing I want out of my gear. And I know it might be a little surprising, but I don't want to intimidate my subjects or distract them. I want to be comfortable. Uh, so I want minimal, min, minimum bulk and, and weight for, from gear if I'm going to be walking around all afternoon. 
Um, I want to be, I want to avoid being distracted by my gear. I want it to be super simple to, to operate. And I want to avoid triggering any unwanted setting by accident. And it's happened to me before to like rent a camera and, and you know, I was using it all afternoon and then I, I somehow I tripped something and I was in panorama mode or something for the rest of the afternoon and I didn't know. And then I got home and all I got were, you know, like beginnings of, of panoramas or something. And that's, that's something I cannot have. Like I cannot waste an afternoon like this just by triggering the wrong setting. So um, I really, at the end of the day, I want to connect with my subjects without feeling the presence of the camera between us. It, it has to be about between me and my subjects. The camera has to be sort of uh, forgotten. I, I, I don't wanna think about the camera when I'm out. So um, what does that mean concretely? I bring one camera, one small camera and one lens with me. I don't bring anything else in terms of lenses. Um, I, it fits in a small shoulder bag. Um, that's actually empty once I get the camera out of it. Like I'm just carrying an empty bag that has, you know, has a few other things like extra battery and so on, but nothing, no other lenses or cameras or anything in it. And I don't have any accessories like a tripod or a flash or anything like that. That would be, uh, you know, there's really just the camera and the lens in that bag. Uh, and of course, I bring a few other things. <laughs> Some of them you, you may uh, be surprised about. I, I always bring an energy bar because I, I can't shoot when I'm hungry. Yeah, I just don't do well. So I, I always have a bar just in case. Um, I bring a light windbreaker, uh, which, you know, like if I'm at the beach or something and the wind starts blowing, I don't want to have to go back home because I'm too cold or whatever. So I, I bring that if I think that might be needed. I always have an extra battery. And I always have an extra SD card because, you know, I, I might do something where I leave the screen on or whatever, and the battery gets depleted faster than I thought. Um, I, I don't want to have to go home for any of these uh, things. I do bring dog treats. Right now, I'm, I'm shooting a dog project in Venice uh, called Dogtown, and uh, I, uh, I have always have treats with me, but I find that it's always helpful, even when I'm not shooting the dog project, just to make friends with people. Like, I, you know, it's always when you give a, you know, you see somebody with a dog, you give the dog a treat, you've all instantly made friends uh, with the dog and with the human. So it's always helpful. And I always have business cards because people ask, you know, I ask if they want me to share the photos and the easiest thing is just to pass my card and say, just contact me and I'll, I'll be happy to show the photos. That way I don't have anything to do that until they contact me and, and uh, somebody else is gonna be on my Instagram. So, so that's all, those are all the things that I have in my bag, really like for, for real, I'm not, um, this, if you bump into me in Venice, ask me to open my bag, this is what, what will be in it. And if you think one camera, one lens is limiting, and I know like a lot of people are kind of, when I say this, they're like, oh yeah, ideally I'd have a camera and a lens, but I have, you know, like that's too limiting. So I have to bring this and that. When I start my workshops, people bring tons of lenses and cameras. By the last day of the workshop, I guarantee you everybody has one camera, one lens because they, they got it. Right? But they, they might do it the first couple of days, but that's it. Uh, after that, they understand the benefits of, of working with one camera, one lens. And um, you, I mean, as you see here, I look more like a tourist, you know, as, as opposed to the, you know, this person in the darker uh, shade here that has this giant bag. And it's a good thing. You want to look like a tourist. You don't want people to think you're a professional photographer or anything like that. You, you really want to pass as, you know, as uh, you don't want to intimidate anybody. So, so looking like to, to a tourist is, is great. Um, I have, the other thing is I have one less decision to make. Uh, when the moment appears, I don't have to think about what focal, even with a zoom, I'd have to think like what focal length do I want to be in. I don't have to think about that. I, my lens is on the camera. It's a fixed, it's a prime lens. That's what I have. That's what I shoot with. Uh, I never miss a shot while changing lenses. So that's, you know, that's great. It used to happen to me, you know, things would happen. I'd be like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm changing my lens and I can't get it. And, uh, and, and you always fumble for stuff when, when you do that. And the more, you know, the moment is happening, the, the more nervous one gets and, and it gets messy. And, and I can shoot for longer because I'm just carrying very few things. So, um, so which lens do I bring since I only bring one? Definitely not a telephoto because I don't want my images to feel like um, 
they're taken from like 50 feet away. I want the viewer, when they look at my images, I want them to feel like they're part of the scene, like they're included in the scene, that it connects with them. And um, what I find is with a telephoto, you can't have that look. You have, you have a look where you're, it looks like you're looking through binoculars and, and it doesn't connect quite as well with, with the viewer. I don't want anything too white either because I don't want to get have to get too too close and I don't want to distort people's faces either so I don't I, I usually don't work with anyone anything um, uh, shorter than a 28. I uh, find 28 is great anything short like a 24 I mean you can get great build it you know build it for buildings architecture I'm not saying that's that's not great for that but for people I find that really it's it's somewhere in between 28 and 50 that, that you want. And which one you use between 28, 35, 50, you know, or in between, you know, there's some 40s and 45s and all kinds of different uh, focal lengths in between. It's deeply personal. You know, frankly, I, I used to shoot with a 50 and loving, I loved it. Cartier-Bresson shot with a 50 all his life. Um, but I found that I just wanted to try something slightly wider. So now 35, and after many, you know, try, much trial and error, 35 is really my Goldilocks lens. That's really, it, I mean, I, I only carry that one with me and I never feel like I'm missing anything. So, um, and it has another advantage uh, to, to have that one lens that, that I, get, I got used to is that I can memorize the angle of view. I, I know exactly, Given what distance I am from the subject, I know exactly what the frame will render. So I don't, oftentimes I don't even have to look through the viewfinder. And um, not that I want to hide, it's not a shooting from the hip thing. I know a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, sort of people, you know, there's a lot of people teaching about, you know, you want to be invisible. So shooting from the hip is a great thing. I never sh shoot from the hip for that reason. I, I don't like, you know, kind of hiding. Uh, I mean, I, I try to be invisible, but I'm not going to shoot from the hip just to hide from people. I think that's a little bit creepy and, and not, not a, I don't know, that's, that's not, uh, it's, it's not what I want to do. I prefer to actually use the ability to shoot from the hip or shoot without looking through the viewfinder to place the camera in a position that it normally isn't. So either, you know, very close to the ground or above my head or, you know, give the viewer some, a, a different uh, way of looking at a subject, you know, something that they're not used to normally seeing. So that's what I use the, the this ability that I get from shooting uh, with a prime lens that I know really well, and where I don't have to look through the through the viewfinder. So I know that what you know. Again, I'm going to insist a little bit because I know to a lot of people it's it's very it feels very limiting uh, the one camera one lens. But all these people, uh, Cartier Bresson, Winogrand, Merowitz. Uh, Martin Frank, Elliot Erwitt, Robert Frank, all these people shot one camera, one lens for, for most of their work. And it's, it's not by accident and they were not trying, it wasn't a stunt. It's really what worked best for them. And I, I can say that's also what works best for me. It works best for, for, for a lot of people who, who do a lot of street work. So uh, again, you know, if you haven't tried this, trust me on this, go, go out for a couple of times with just one camera, one lens, and, you know, figure out which lens is kind of your Goldilocks lens, but uh, you'll see how freeing that is. It's, it's really a transformation. And people in my workshops are, you know, rave about that once they, once they really uh, connect with that notion. Um, now, you might argue, okay, but all these guys that I just mentioned also shot film. <laughs> uh, so should I shoot film too? And that's another, you know, big thing that comes up a lot uh, in my workshops, people, you know, bring in their film cameras and stuff. And uh, here, I'll give you my personal take about shooting film in 2021. Uh, these guys back then did not have a choice. They, they, you know, whether or not to shoot film, that's all there was. Uh, I do. And so I'll show you this little clip from Gary Winogrand. I don't know if we'll actually hear the, uh, the audio, but it doesn't matter because you'll, you'll see what he does. Um, and, and, and then we'll, I'll, I'll pick back up with, my, with uh, what, what, I, what I think about film. So there he is. He was shooting. He, he was uh, 
it was changing film. Just when this opportunity presented itself, he had to change his film. So he missed it because he was changing his role of film. Anyway, um, <laughs> there he goes. He's pretty fast too at doing it, obviously, because he, he was going through, this is a guy who was just shooting many roles of film every time he would go out. But um, anyway, my point is, I actually bought a, a film camera a couple of years ago thinking, okay, maybe I should you know, get back into shooting film. There's a lot to like about shooting film. But um, every time I go out, I look at my, uh, it's a uh, Leica M2. I look at that Leica M2. I look at my M10, which is the digital version of, of that, much more, more modern. And I'm thinking like, do I really want to be productive today or do I want to just have fun shooting film? And at the end of the day, I want to be productive. For me, that's really what's most important. So I, I always, that M2 is on a shelf. It's beautiful. I look at it, you know, I love looking at it, but I, I don't use it because I feel like I'm much more productive with my, my digital gear. Now, you know, I think if you've shot film all your life and, and film is, is really your thing and you don't want to move to digital, I, I totally understand and, and, you know, by all means. But I think a lot of people shoot film these days because it, I don't know, there's a sort of a, a hype around around film and everything. I, I don't think people are as um, as as effective or as productive when when they should film, you know. And, and so anyway, I, I'm I shoot only digital at this point. And I've shot film many years, you know, in the '90s and you know when, when digital wasn't around. So it's not like I never shot film. But now that digital is here, I feel like that's it's much more productive for me. So uh, I want to go through a little bit of my settings, you know, since we're in the how I prepare for this, um, for, for a shoot. Um, of course, I shoot raw um, because that's what enables me later in post to really process the image to my liking. Uh, if I shot JPEG, you know, I, I wouldn't have the, the uh, as much flexibility to work the image. So I, I shoot raw and, you know, cards now are, I mean, you can buy a huge memory card for super cheap there's no it used to be that you have to you'd have to kind of think about you know do i really want to uh only have 30 or 40 images on my card now it's like unlimited so uh, that's not a consideration anymore um i always set my image review to off so i don't because i don't want my screen to distract me and i want better battery life and the battery life, I know, goes down a lot when you start reviewing the images after each each uh, each image shot. Um, sometimes I look at the, you know, I, I'll shoot a first image just to make sure my settings are okay when I first start shooting. But that's it. After that, I don't look at the screen at all, and I leave. I I, I set the image review to off. I uh, one thing that I find very very important is to disable the auto power off of the camera. And this is something I didn't know when I first started, you know, doing street photography. Things happen super fast and you can't, um, you don't have the time to ask yourself whether your camera's on or off and whether you should turn it on. I know cameras turn on really fast these days, but even the asking yourself whether it ha whether it's on or off and, and turning it on, um, sometimes just you miss the moment or you have a late start and then it's hard to recover. So personally, I turn my camera on as soon as I get on the street when I start my shoot and I don't turn it off till I'm back in my car. Um, so it has to, so, and, and that's, I know not every camera does that and that I don't use a camera that will not let, it, let me uh, keep it on the whole time. Uh, if it goes to sleep, it's no, it's no good. I, I need a camera that will just stay on and be ready for when I need to, to use it. Um, another um, setting that I've been using for a few years now that works great is auto ISO. Uh, used to be that, you know, ISO was problematic. Now with modern cameras, I mean, the ISO is just, you know, you can shoot 6,400, even higher. So I just set it to auto ISO and let the camera decide what's best. Um, and I shoot an aperture priority because most of the time the speed uh, doesn't matter unless I want to do some kind of a motion, you know, like an artistic blur or something. It's a very specific case. But other than that use case, I just leave it in, on aperture priority uh, and I want to decide uh, about the aperture because that's what determines my depth of field and that's super important to how the, the final image is going to look. But uh, speed, I'm, I'm not as, I just let the camera decide what speed it wants to, to shoot. Um, and I do use exposure compensation at about 
minus 0.7 or minus one uh, because I know that my the sensor that I use tends to uh, clip the highlights and uh, and you can't recover the highlights and um, on the other hand, uh, anything in the shadows can be recovered very easily. You almost never can clip the shadows in that camera. So I, I underexpose. It depends on the camera you're using. You know, if your camera does great in the highlights, not so much in the shadows, you want to, you know, adjust for your own gear. But this is what I use. So the next thing is just to plan when and where I go. And so, you know, my projects, a lot of my projects have been in Venice for the street, street photography work. And there's, I know there's this kind of romantic myth that you can go out at any time um, with your camera and it doesn't matter when and where and you'll have a great time. The reality is you can't photograph strong moments if they're not happening. You, <laughs> if you're going to be a, a moment driven street photographer, which, you know, a lot of the street photographers, they're, you know, that's what they're looking for is for moments. If there's no moments happening, you can't, you can't photograph what's not there. So I tend to plan again, it's like part of my game plan is to figure out when to go. And I, I don't mind driving to, to Venice. It's 20 minutes away. It's hard to park. Uh, but uh, but I still do it because I know that's where the moments are. And I research what times are busiest and most interesting. And what I'm showing here in my slide is that there's actually a, uh, a webcam. And a lot of the landmarks that you might shoot at, you know, if you're in Times Square in New York, or there's webcams that are constantly streaming what's happening in the street. So let's say you're, you know, in a suburb in New York or something, and you want to go to Times Square, but you're not sure exactly if it's, you know, uh, busy enough, although Times Square is always busy. Um, so for Venice, I have this webcam and I just pull it up on my laptop and I'm like, ah. so if it looks like this, like the, the screenshot that I took, I probably won't go. It's, it's not, this is not busy enough for me to go. Uh, but if it gets, you know, I see that it's, it gets a little more active or it's a holiday weekend and I can see people are really starting to pour in, then, then it's, it's worth going. So having th those webcams are, not many people uh, use those, but they're, they're super useful for that kind of uh, thing. Also for the sky, I look, you know, are there clouds, you know, what the light is like, you know, you can figure all these things out just by looking at the webcam. So, okay, so now I'm at the right spot. I'm, I'm on the boardwalk. Uh, it's the right time. It's busy. Um, I, I tend to, oh, I, I didn't go through what I wear. I tend to try to wear stuff that blends in. So if I go to Venice, I'll have like jeans and a t-shirt and a baseball cap, you know, that, that sort of vibe, because I know I'm not going to stand out. Like I'm going to be just like the rest of the crowd. And so anyway, the place is buzzing. The street is, you know, full of energy. So what's my game plan at that point? Do I pick a spot and wait for people to come to me or do I walk around? And for me, uh, the short answer is it depends. Uh, I, you know, it, it's actually, you know, if, if you have a place that's very concentrated with landmarks like Venice Beach, uh, where everybody eventually walks through a certain spot, then, uh, you know, I'm talking like a Times Square Venice Beach situation again, then picking a high traffic spot that everybody will eventually get to is actually a pretty good strategy because when you're not moving, you have a lot less to think about, you know, where to place your feet, you know, who to bump again, you know, not to bump into people and so on. So it's easier to focus on watching people and, and looking for opportunities. So it, it can be actually a great way. I know a lot of people when they do street photography, they walk around, myself included, but sometimes it's actually really good to just stay in place. You know, and, and I, for, for those who haven't tried this, this is something I always do with my students. I have this exercise where they have to stay for a while in one spot, uh, in one busy spot and just get what, what comes to them. And it's a great exercise. So if you haven't tried this, I highly recommend that. Uh, of course, you have to be in a spot that, that works for that, where there's enough traffic. Um, but if, it's, you know, if, if, it, if you're in a situ situation where it's more spread out and there's no landmarks like that, uh, then walking around might be your best shot. And personally, I do a little bit of both. I, I will go through Venice. I have my spots that I stop at and I have spots that I, you know, I just kind of walk in between. So I, I kind of do a mix of both. And so let's say we've decided to walk around. The next question is, again, you know, in that game plan, how do I know what to shoot? What, what, how do I decide what's, what's uh, you know, worth my time to, 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 uh, uh, to focus on, on trying to capture a scene? And 
for me, again, this is my method. There's four types of situations that I tend to encounter. I've already categorized them and I know what to do in each the, with each one of those situations. If, and if I'm stuck, you know, there are some days where I'm like, uh, you know, I just feel overwhelmed. The street is buzzing, but I'm not sure what to focus on. I just pick one. I, I know these are the four things. I just pick one and I just, I try to find the, the you know, I, I try to put myself in that mode. So the four situations are, one is I see a character with great potential. You know, so some days I'm like, I'm, I'm really into that mode of, of trying to focus on, on one character. So that's one of the methods. Two, I come across a great background or great light, you know, so it's, that's another type of situation. Three is I bump into some sort of a developing scene, usually involving multiple people. Uh, so that, that's another, that's the third one. Um, and then the fourth thing is just, you know, you're walking and something just kind of hits you in the face. There's a great moment that just unfolds right in front of you. So that's the fourth one. Um, so in my workshop, I teach uh, how to work each one of those situations. That's very much part of the method that I teach. I obviously had, don't have the time here to, to, uh, to teach all, all four. I mean, we just have a limited amount of time today. So I'm going to do a quick preview for you of what the first situation, which is one of the, you know, my favorites. Um, what do you do if you see a character? So you're now you're out walking in the street and you see this, this character. But first of all, what, what do I define by a character? What, what's a character? So it could be that dog that we just saw on the skateboard. Uh, it could be this woman right here. Uh, it's basically somebody who stands out uh, in some way by their behavior, their clothing. They have an interesting dog or they are an interesting dog. Um, they, have, they have an unusual bike. I mean, it could be any of these things uh, and, and more. It's someone who stands out. And it's typically someone who would make a great photo. You look, you know, you see the person, you're like, oh my God, this would be a great photograph. But you need to get them at a peak moment, which they may not be, you know, when you, when you see them, chances are there's not a peak moment happening and you need to get them in front of a, in a better background and with better light. So, you know, you see them, you see the potential, but it, it's not quite right for, for a photo yet. So the old me, what I used to do uh, back when people were telling you, oh, you have to remain invisible and, 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 you know, you can't do street photography unless you're totally invisible and that sort of thing. Well, what I used to do was I would try to steal a shot, you know, I try to like, they would pass me and I'd just take a discreet picture. I don't know if, you know, probably a lot of you can, um, this probably, uh, has happened to you at some point, you know, you saw this great, op you know, great character and you're like, oh my God, they can't, I can't be seen. So just going to take a quick shot and see what happens. And, you know, one time, you know, nine times out of 10 or, or more like 99 times out of 100, I would, you know, it, it would not look anything great. You know, I, I um, would typically not have enough time to frame or compose properly. It was, you know, it would be badly lit. They would be distracting things in the background. And it would, I would get results like this image that's on the screen right now. You know, I'm not, so this image is not to show you a great image. It's to show you, you know, I, I, this is a real scene I actually bumped into. I bumped into these characters. There's actually one more guy as part of the group that I think was behind them. So I didn't yet ha even have the whole, the whole group, but I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get them again. I, I placed my camera low again, that the, the whole thing of separating the camera from the eye. And I took this, this shot very quick quickly because I, I just wanted to have a picture and I didn't know what I was going to do next. So what I do instead, instead of just, just grabbing this shot real quick and hoping for the best now is that I follow the, the subject. And that's usually where I need to make a decision is do I follow the subject discreetly, you know, without trying not to be noticed, or do I establish contact with them? And, and I'll, ex I'll explain kind of both and, and how I would do both. Now, it depends on the character and the situation. If the character is there to be noticed, you know, it's a parade, you know, like we saw that woman, you know, that was part of a parade. It's a protest. Uh, it might be like here in Cuba, I was uh, photographing teenagers jumping off uh, rocks on the Malecon. And, 
you know, they're there to be seen, you know, they're, they're there to kind of show off and everything. So in those situations, it's perfectly fine to start shooting without addressing anybody. And they may see you, they may not see you, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to hide. They're there to be seen, to be photographed. They're showing off. So it doesn't matter. But in most cases, it's not as clear cut. And as you can see on the, in the video here, I'm a middle-aged bearded guy, you know, so creeping up on people is not my best look. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not a good look for me. So I usually prefer approaching the character uh, to gain their trust and have their permission, the, the per, their permission to follow them. And so I'll, I'll tell you how I do that. And we'll, you know, we'll go through kind of a, a pretend exercise here. But um, so th that scene that we just saw with the, that old, old lady in the wheelchair, uh, let's go back to that and I'll tell you exactly how it unfolded. So I actually stopped them for a moment and I said, I love how you guys look with the tattoos and the dogs and the beards. And like, it's, it, I'm, I'm a, a street photographer in, in Venice and I'm doing a, a a photography project on the dogs of Venice and, and I love how your dogs look and, and how you have them on your lap and everything. Do you mind if I follow you for a bit and I'll take a few candid photos? And by the way, I'm totally happy to share them with you later. Uh, here's my card. Actually, I don't give them the card till later because otherwise they hold the card and the card isn't all the photos. But I, I'll I say I, I'm happy to share with them with you later. And please ignore me, um, pretend I'm not there. I'm just shooting candidates, but don't, you know, don't mind me if I'm just following you for a bit. And so essentially, at first I started with a heartfelt compliment about what drew me to them. You know, why did I think they were a character? And, and so I just tell them, you know, point blank. You know, I love your hat, love your glasses, love your tattoos, whatever it is that drew me, I'm being honest with them and, and letting them know. Then I'm explaining quickly what I'm doing, why I'm there and what I'm doing. And I ask for permission to follow them. Um, and, and I offer to share the photos as an incentive. You know, if they let me follow them, they'll get photos. You know, who, who doesn't like that? And then I just remind them that it's candid and that they can just ignore me. So that's, that's essentially what I'm doing. Does it work? Absolutely. It works, I would say, more than 90% of the time people say, oh, yeah, great. Perfect. Um, yeah, don't forget to send me the pictures. Love it. So you now there are, you know, a few people, you know, if you ask to enough people, eventually you'll get a rejection, you know, one out of 10 or less will, will reject it, depending on where you are, it might be more than one out of 10. But I just take the rejection gracefully. It's not a personal thing. You know, I was asking for something, they didn't want it. That's fine. I just move on and look for the next character. So, but when it works, which, you know, again, for me, it's most of the time, the vast majority of time it works, instead of trying that quick, badly composed snapshot that I was going to take, I now have the license to follow these people, you know, up and down the boardwalk. Uh, and I get multiple opportunities with different moments, different backgrounds here. I tried, you know, I saw this guy, you know, coming in with a surfboard. I was like, maybe I can juxtapose the surfboard and the dog was looking at the guy with the surfboard um, and there's the tattoo shop in the back I'm not saying this is a great picture but it's just another opportunity that I got to to you know that I wouldn't have had had I just tried to take a snapshot and that not engaged with them now so now that I've earned the right to um, to, to to stay with them I do what I call working the scene and it's not me who calls it that. It's a photojournalistic term. I just, so at that point, I'm in the mode where I'm working the scene in a candid way. So at that point, I have two objectives. One is to make sure the people in the scene ignore me so I can still shoot candid. Um, two is to think creatively about what to try, you know, to get best design I can uh, for the photograph. Uh, so, you know, in terms of light and background and, and layering and so on best information for storytelling you know like i in this case i have to include at least a good chunk of the wheelchair so we understand that she's sitting in the wheelchair because if it's just her head then we don't get this you know so i have to make sure i include all the information that's important for the shot and i have to wait for peak moments so that's those are the things i think about when i'm in i'm working the scene so how do I become a fly on the wall after I've already talked to the subjects? You know, and that's all, to a lot of people, this is kind of a foreign concept. Like if you're 
you're either, either invisible or you're visible. And if you're visible, then it's, you know, how do you recover? How do you, how do you become invisible again? Well, it's very feasible. You, you, you can become invisible again. You just have to stop talking to them. So I, I, at, that, at the point where I have their permission, I stop talking to them altogether. They might talk to me, they might address me, but then if they do, I just respond very with very short answers, kind of signaling to them I'm not interested in chatting. I'm, I'm interested in taking pictures. I make myself physically small, so I, you know, I tuck my elbows in. I move smoothly. I'm, I'm not. I'm trying not to distract them too much. And if necessary, I remind them that I'm shooting candid. So if they, you know, if they start looking at me or talking to me, I say, "Look, I'm, I just want to shoot candids. Um, again, I'll share the photos with you, but just pretend I'm not here." And eventually, some people take longer than others, but most people after a while just go back to what they were doing because you're boring. You're not talking to them. You're not giving them long answers. You're not chatting with them. At some point they just ignore you and they go right back to what they were doing, uh, which is exactly what I want. So that's really when the fun starts, honestly. So I'm allowed to stick around and I'm a fly on the wall again. Uh, that I'm, so I, I'm able to shoot candid. So did you notice, by the way, as we were kind of going through these slides, there's, I, I've gotten quite a few images from the same scene. This is the same people, same dogs, you know, same everything. And it's much more productive than if I had to just grab that quick snapshot. I was able to follow them all, basically the whole boardwalk until they turned off to go somewhere else. So, um, and, and frankly, also for me, I find it a lot more satisfying because when I first engaged with them, I got to meet them. I got to hear their story. I got to understand like why, you know, who they, that they were friends, that uh, how they had met, all that stuff. Before I stopped talking to them to try to be that fly on the wall again, I had that whole interaction with them, which I found really satisfying. And um, so anyway, to me, that's like half the pleasure of street photography is like getting into all these people's worlds uh, that I normally wouldn't, you know, I, I would never meet these people otherwise. So um, now let's talk about a little bit more about how I actually work the scene because I kind of alluded to working the scene, but I want to give you a little more specifics on what I do to work the scene when I'm once I'm allowed. And in my course, you know, when if you came to my workshops or if you did my online uh, uh, masterclass, I talk about the recipe to a great street photograph, and I talk about it as having three main ingredients that you're looking for. One is great design, and that can be the composition, the light, the colors, if you're shooting color, uh, tones, if you're shooting in black and white. Uh, so that's your design. The information, which includes you know, the clues that you need for storytelling, essentially, that's the information. So including what you need to include and then excluding the non-essential non elements and, and making everything readable. That's, that's, that's what goes into the information portion. And then the moment. So timing the shot to highlight a peak moment, uh, an emotion, an action, you know, that sort of thing. So once again, I can't go in, in depth into it. You know, we don't have enough time to go in depth into each one of these things. There's a lot to say on each one of those, but that's the magic recipe that guides me when I work the scene is DIM, design information in moment. And that is what makes street photography so hard. I think it's one of the hardest forms of photography, frankly, because you need to get all these ingredients perfect in 250th of a second. And it's, it's just super hard to think about all these things and get everything right um, you know, in, in that you know, fraction of a second. So usually what I personally you know, find the most difficult and what I also see my students struggle with the most is separating uh, separating everything in the frame and visual hierarchy, meaning what do you want the viewer to look at first and next and next so that they're not overwhelmed with everything at the same level. There's a, a way to kind of decode the photo that's kind of guided, if you will. So that's visual hierarchy. And it's, it's super hard to organize because when we're photographing a scene like this, it, you know, we're photographing the chaos of real life, but we're trying to manage it so it's like orderly and organized in, in a photograph that's easy for somebody to read. Super hard. 
And so by separation, I mean, you know, you don't want objects like trees or posts growing out of people's backs. You don't want a person growing out of somebody else's back. The growing out thing is, you know, if you go to photojournalism school, you hear that a lot. Um, and, and you want to, you know, an image that has a clear primary subject. Um, and so in situations like this, this was like an incredible puzzle to try to solve. And, and I, I like those. I don't always nail them. This one, you know, I was lucky that day. And I, I, I mean, it's not just luck. It, part of it is luck. Uh, but part of it is I was really looking to try to separate everything. And it's, as you can see, it's like barely separated and there's very little room, but it somehow it all fits. And, and when it does, it really clicks. And this was in, in, in National Geographic. And I mean, this image was, was very successful for that reason, because it's separate, it's correctly separated and it has great visual hierarchy. So what tools do I have at my disposal uh, to separate and organize? So this is me, you know, this is not a great photo, but it's, it's actually extracted from a video that somebody took of me working. But I have, I can position myself uh, and angle my camera. So that affects, you know, the, the light, the angle, the background separation, uh, the separation of the different characters, uh, the visual hierarchy, all that stuff can be done by me positioning myself in the right spot and, and uh, in the, at the right height. Um, so I, I often shoot up like this where, where the, the I'm low and the camera is aiming up. Uh, and that's because it's much easier to get a clean background and also to separate things when you're shooting from a low angle. So then it's also what I decide to include and exclude. You know, that's part of the tools I have. Um, exclu and excluding the right things or the wrong things from the frame, it goes a long way in making a photo more readable. So you know, sometimes you have to wait for things to get out of the frame. Sometimes you have to kind of move slightly. And, and then it's settings like point of focus and aperture and things like that that kind of help um, you know, with organizing everything. And, and patience. You know, like I said, sometimes you have to wait for something to get out of the frame. And there's no way to exclude that thing other than waiting for it to, to, to get out. So when I'm working a scene, I, I like to walk around and experiment with many different things. I try to come up with ideas. And I'm, my, my brain is going like 1,000 miles an hour. And I'm carefully looking, you know, critically looking through my viewfinder for things in the background, for things in the corners. And so like this image is actually also from Cuba. I was photographing, it wasn't moving. You know, so that you would think this is like the easiest subject to photograph. So it's like a bunch of old people playing dominoes for hours. And I'm there and I'm allowed to stick around and, and shoot this. And it took me about an hour to get this photo. I was trying all kinds of things. Background was terrible. Um, I was trying to problem solve for all these things. It took me about an hour to get this shot. And um, it took, you know, like, I was like, okay. At some point I, it clicked. I was like, I got a really short depth of field above the shoulder of one of the players, waiting for a moment where everything is separated, having all the hands in there. So I. But you know, it took me an hour to get to that uh, notion. You don't always have that much time, but if you, whatever time you have, it's really, your brain should be just like looking for ideas for how to shoot this in the right way. Again, this is another one that made it into Nat Geo, so worth the, worth the wait. But um, it's you know, it really takes a lot of thinking. So while I work the scene, I'm also trying to anticipate a real moment, uh, and. Following, you know, as I mentioned, I usually get multiple opportunities. And I, as you saw with the wheelchair scene, I, I did get multiple opportunities. So um, you learn to anticipate them better. The more you do this, the more you, you learn, but also with a specific subject, they tend to have, uh, you know, recurring gestures or things. You, know, you learn to, to anticipate them, the better than you know them, the more time you've spent with them, the easier it is to anticipate uh, real moments, you know, it could be some, you know, a couple kissing and you notice that, you know, there's a whole uh, pattern going on and, and you, you're able to, you might miss one kiss, but you, you might get the next one because you kind of know how, how things work. So I totally get that this is a lot to, you know, once you hear like, oh my God, I have to pay attention to all this stuff. Are you kidding? This is like, how am I supposed to do this? But if you think about it, it's very much like driving a car. You know, first you learn how to drive a car and then you practice for many hours and eventually it's like second nature, right? 
you, you know, I, I doubt that anybody on this, uh, you know, listening to this uh, still thinks about, you know, putting on, you know, when to put it, put on their blinker or, you know, how to, when to look uh, through the rearview mirror, all this stuff just kind of happens automatically. It's like, you know, ingrained in, in you, it's, it's in your brain and it's, you don't have to think. So most, you know, but, but if you look at photography, most photographers don't really, they kind of skip on, on learning a method and they don't practice very often. So imagine if, if people drove that way without learning how to drive and didn't dr drive very many hours, you know, you, we'd have like terrible accidents all over the place. So I think it's worth, you know, just spending the time learning how to do it right and then practicing it. And, and all this stuff kind of falls into place after a while, once you practice it enough. So anyway, so that was just a quick walkthrough of like how I work with a, a character that I spot. Um, obviously, there's three other methods, and I, I can't uh, share them here. But again, if you if you come to my workshops or, or you join my masterclass, we, we can talk about these more. Uh, let now let's talk about what I do when I get back home. So first, uh, I want to make the distinction um, between editing and what I call editing and processing, because even Photoshop, if you look at what Photoshop means by editing, they mean processing. By editing, I mean only picking the best images. So like the needle in the haystack thing, that's what I mean by editing. Uh, just picking the best images, not doing anything to them yet, just picking the best ones. Processing is actually taking the best images and making them look even better. So that, that's just to, to, uh, to clarify my, my terminology. And this is a photojournalistic uh, terminology. That's if you go to photojournalism school, you'll talk about editing and you'll talk about processing as two separate things. So when I'm editing, I need to distance myself from the emotion from the shoot. Like I might have had a great time with uh, you know, the lady in the wheelchair and those two guys with the beards and everything, but I can't let that taint my perception of how well the pictures came out which is really hard to do <laughs> like it's the two are really uh intertwined and it's really hard for us as photographers to if we've had a great time on a shoot it's really hard for us to put that aside and just look at the images on their own merit and so it helps to let time pass that's one thing that you know the more you forget about the shoot the more that emotional attachment is is broken which you want and it helps to ignore the merit of, like sometimes we get uh, enamored with our ideas. So if we had a, I had this great idea during the shoot and I tried this thing and maybe it didn't quite work to the level that I wanted it to work, but I had this great idea. So I'm still attached to that and I might rate this image higher even though it didn't quite hit the mark. So that we have to kind of detach the idea that we had from the actual result. And then it really helps to have a, objective criteria by which you're looking at the images. And for that, again, I use this DIM, design information moment, uh, when I look at my images to, to make the decision, you know, whether this is an image that should um, be chosen or, or not. So, you know, by having this objective criteria, it's much easier because the emotional stuff kind of goes away. So typically I wait at least a few days before looking at the images. And this is like very practical. This is how I do it. I go in Lightroom, you know, you might be using another software. I look at the images in full screen. It's the F key for those who don't know, you just hit the F key and they go full screen. So you don't have any uh, distractions from all the tools and everything. And then I start with a broad edit of everything that I shot and I give everything that I consider as a potential select. It's not a select just yet but a potential select would be one star. So I, I go through it. I don't try to make it two, three, four stars. I just go one star for anything that might have some merit. And that way um, I can filter by one star when, I, when I'm done with through the whole thing. And all I see is the pictures that I think might have merit. And it just uh, you know, hides everything else, which is, my, you know, it may, if you might be going from like 200 pictures to 20 pictures, uh, which is really helpful. And then I decide which ones to process because once you decide what to process, processing takes time. You don't want to process everything. So I go back through the one stars and I put two stars to the images that I think are worth processing. So let's say I chose 20 images. Now I might only have 10 
that I judge, you know, those are really the ones that are worth putting the processing time into. Then I process them. And again, <laughs> you'll hear me, it's like a broken record. Uh, what am I processing them for? D, I, and M. I want to emphasize the best design. I want to emphasize um, the best information, omitting things that are not important and including things that are importing, uh, important visual you know, storytelling details. And I want to emphasize the moment. So obviously you're more, the more you evolve down that process of, you know, the, the shoot and then the, the processing of the, the, the editing and the processing, the, the further you are, the fewer things you can change about an image, right? You can't optimize, you can't make a great design if the image wasn't taken properly to start with, but you can still um, emphasize a great, a good design can become a great design if you process it properly. So that's what I process for is D, I, and M. So again, I have this objective criteria that I'm following to process my images. It's not just what will make them pretty. It's what makes the most, how can I optimize for DIM? So for example, on this image, which was uh, part of my uh, book, um, uh, my, my, my last book about the, the family who lives in the bus, uh, nowhere to go but everywhere. So in this case, I actually cropped pretty much as much as I would crop ever crop an image. So that's why I'm showing this one is kind of an extreme cropping situation. But the top of the image, you, know, you, you can see, even though it's a little bit dark, um, you know, it's like surrounding buildings, not really important for, for what's going on. Uh, there's a lot of too much of the bus involved in here. And the bottom is also dark and there's not much in it. So I squeezed it down to just the dad looking at the engine, you know, with his body language, you know, signaling that he's kind of stumped. And then the kid running through the parking lot. and my whole processing was based on making this image, you know, powerful in terms of uh, design information and moment. So once it's cropped and once it's processed and it's in black and white, this is what it looks like. It looked okay in color. It's just the project was uh, a black and white project. So converted to black and white. This is a project I actually shot in color and converted to black and white. Usually I worked straight in, in black and white, uh, but this is a project I wasn't sure which way it was gonna go until I was further into the project. And you know, obviously, it's important. It's important not to overprocess because you can you can easily go overboard with those tools. Uh, but anyway, so I got to this point, and then once I'm happy with the processed image, I will give it three stars, sometimes four stars, but more than more often than not, I'll just give it three stars. And that's when I start digesting. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's only over time that the best images sort of reveal themselves and the bad images sort of, you know, fall behind. And so it's important before posting anything to have that dig digestion time, not to go straight to Instagram or Facebook and, and start posting, because you're not sure yet that the image will stand, stand the test of time. So what I do is I actually use in Lightroom, this becomes like a big endorsement for Lightroom, but I, this is how I know how to work. I mean, I'm not saying this is the only way to work, uh, I sync with Lightroom Mobile, so this is my phone, and I get to see all my images that I want to sync on my phone, and that's great for, like, if I'm in line at Starbucks or at the supermarket or whatever, I, instead of going through my feed, I just go through this, and I review the images that I shot recently. Are they growing on me? Am I getting tired of them? And then based on that, I upgrade or downgrade their star rating accordingly. So an image that's great, you know, will move up to maybe four or five stars. An image that's not so great, it will go back from three stars to, down to two or, or one. And time is my friend. Again, it's like wine. And, you know, I after I've lived with the images for two, two plus weeks, usually I consider them posting, uh, I, I consider posting the best ones to, you know, social media and other things. I resist settling for the lesser images to, to post those because um, people always judge you by your worst images, frankly. And it's something we're not all you know, aware of. You know, we're like, hey, you know, sometimes I have good ones, sometimes bad ones. If you post a bad image, this is the image that you'll be remembered for, not, not the good one that you posted a week ago. So you really want to be sure that you know, if you're posting something, you're really proud of it and it, you've had the time to 
to really evaluate that this is an image that, that you, you want. I know we're, we might be running a little long here. Um, I just, to conclude here, really, if your goal is to consistently produce good work, I highly recommend relying on a method like this. It could be my method. If you want to learn it from me, you're you know, welcome to come to my workshops and everything. It could be a, somebody else's method. It could be that you're making your own method. But I think it's important to have, if you're going to produce consistently produce good work, it's important to have a methodology that you follow. Um, the downside is you have to give up the spontaneity that we were talking about in the beginning. Uh, the carelessness that, you know, the, like sh shooting with friends kind of thing that, that that doesn't, it's not compatible with this type of shooting. Um, it, you have to learn the methodology, you have to spend many hours practicing it, practicing it, and you have to post fewer images, frankly, to social media, you, you won't post the same number of images. But in my experience, it's been worth it. That's, this is what, you know, this methodology and, and this uh, kind of hygiene of how I, I shoot uh, really has propelled me very, very quickly uh, to, to, to doing very interesting things in photography. So I highly recommend uh, that route if this is something that, that you want to do. Real quick, uh, before we take questions, I want to talk about a couple of opportunities. Uh, one, uh, to, to learn with me if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, the Street Photography Masterclass, uh, there's a 20% off coupon that I wanted to share. Uh, that's if you want to just learn on your own. Uh, it's, it's a lot of pre-recorded videos of me explaining this whole methodology. Uh, there's assignments and I do live weekly office hours. So every Thursday we're, we go live and people can ask questions and everything and I'm available um, and it's great. We're, it's a ton of fun. So if you want to join that class, uh, here's the coupon. The link is the courses at patansaki.com and uh, would love to you, have you as part of this class. The students actually also hang out. There's a whole community that kind of got created that way. It's, it's really fun. So that's it. Um, love to take questions if anybody has any. Awesome, excellent. Dotan, thank you so much. Again, a ton of great information. Uh, I know I know we always jam pack you into such a short amount of time, and so it's always difficult, so, but we okay. appreciate it. <laughs> I apologize um, for talking so fast. I was trying to squeeze it all in there. <laughs> no, no, we love it. You know, you know, one thing I did have to mention is, you know, you talked about kind of that that uh, that sort of your body learns that muscle memory, so to speak. And, you know, you're talking about that. I just wanted to let you know, you know. You're talking, you're talking to some people who live in New York City. We don't use blinkers over here in Dotan. So <laughs> we just <laughs> we just turn, we just go and, right. and and if you're in the way, that's well, that's your problem. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so let's All right. let, Point well taken. There you go. Let's let's jump into the questions. Let's get right to it. Elizabeth has a great question. And you talked a little bit about this, and you talked about kind of when you're selecting images how you go about mm -hmm. selecting them and kind of what your process is. And she wants to know, you know, meaning, meaningful pictures to you may not be the same to someone like her or myself. You know, mm -hmm. what do you do to get your point across to somebody else? And I think that's a great question because going back and using sort of that, that imagery that you were showing over, you know, the, the group following them along, how did you ultimately mm -hmm. come to that decision of what image that, that was gonna be used? Yeah, I mean, that's where I think it's really important to have a criteria that is, uh, uh, you know, the, like the, the, this DIM criteria, because it just takes out all the other questions. It, you, you don't have to think about what you like versus what somebody else like and what, you know, what's their favorite color or, or what felt good during the shoot. It's all about which image has the best design. And, and that's, you know, the... the factors, you know, what factors into design is, is pretty well understood in terms of the light, the composition, this and that. So you can easily figure out, you know, which image has the best design. If those, so let's say you go from 10 images now to down to four that all have equally great design. Then you look at the information, you know, do, do all these information have the same storytelling capability? You know, are some weaker in their storytelling? And if they're weaker in the storytelling, does the, do they have a, even better design to compensate for that? Um, you know, if they're equally good on design, then the storytelling is what you look at next. And then ideally the kind of the cherry on top of the cake is, do they have a moment? And which one has the strongest moment? And once you have that, you know, that 
set of objective criteria, it's much easier to you know, take out the, the pictures that you might you know, kind of like, but you're not sure and somebody else may not like. It takes all that doubt out of the equation you have because you have this objective criteria so that's one thing that you know when when we do workshops there, there's a whole bunch of time that's spent on the editing and talking about how to how to pick and everything and we go through a lot of concrete examples and i know it sounds kind of like when i talk about dim it sounds very sort of theoretical but i guarantee you it's it's very uh you know it's very easy to apply and the, you just have to go through a few images and you know we we do those presentations we, we review the last you know day's shoot everybody contributes five images we go through them as a group and i basically explain okay here's uh, we do a critique basically a critique session and i say well this image is great in terms of design but i don't really understand what's happening um so information is zero and then there's no moment so i would have chosen this one instead and it it becomes very concrete once you start going about it this way Awesome, awesome. So Andrea wants to know, uh, if you don't set your shutter speed, you know, you let ISO stay on auto, how do you prevent the shutter, you know, from, from dragging, you know, being too low, being too fast, you know, what, is, what do you- Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So usually in the camera settings, there's a way to uh, set um, the sort of bottom criteria for speed. You, you can say, I want it to work on, um, auto ISO, but I don't want the speed to drop below 125th of a second or 250th of a second or 500th, of whatever speed you want as your minimum speed, you know, that what the camera will do is if there's not enough light, it will get down to that minimum speed. Let's say you said 125th of a second. And if it, there's still not enough light, it will boost up the ISO because you told it it can go auto ISO. So usually that criteria of what the minimum speed is that you want, shutter speed, is uh, in the settings. And uh, you know all kind of recent cameras have that. Uh, and I use, so then it depends on what kind of subject you're photographing if you, and, and what style photographer you are. If, if you photograph sort of, very quick and sort of you move you're you're very um you know agitated with your camera and everything you might want to pick like 250th or more maybe 500th of a second as your minimum speed if you're someone who's much more like you, you hold your camera firmly you're pretty steady you don't move around a lot then 125th of a second might be fine for you and th th by the way these numbers are um, I'm referring to those if you're using a wide angle lens, like a 35 millimeter. If you're using a 50 millimeter or even longer, then those numbers need to be bumped up a whole bunch. Um, it Because it, it, then you have, there's a lot more chance of getting a, a camera shake. Um, so this is another advantage of, for using, uh, another reason to use a wide angle is you can, uh, it, it's more forgiving in terms of the, the speed and the, the camera shake and everything. And, and uh, so you, you don't have to go as high in ISO and I won't bore you with all the details, but it's, it's, it's better for you in that, in awesome. that circumstance. Awesome. <laughs> Send, send, send some people our way for some more wide angle lenses. There you go. <laughs> um, so Veronica wants to know, uh, in regards to processing images, in, and this is obviously very subjective, but we're talking to Dotan. So Dotan is gonna give us, you know, his, his personal view, you know, how Absolutely. much is acceptable for you? You know, how much do you process? Is it really basic and simple where it's just a brightness contrast, maybe possibly levels, or are you going to sub you know, really far off land and, you know, just completely. Yeah, so I, I mean, it depends on the, on the photograph. I, I try to make it look natural. Like I think processing an image to the point where it doesn't look natural anymore. You can see little weird, you know, artifacts here and there, like the, your sky looks weird and, and people's faces look distorted and things and like, or too wrinkled and things like that. That kind of thing is, is uh, a no-no for me. So I stopped short of that. Um, I think it's, you know, the more you can emphasize design and information and moment, using the tools of, of Photoshop or Lightroom or some plugins, I think that's great. Um, I, for my street photography, I tend to use a plugin call, called Silver Effects uh, for when I work in black and white. And uh, I, you know, it, so this image, for example, um, it was shot backlit, you know, so you know, like right now you're looking at uh, Jenna in the, in the snake, uh, which is on the, on the cover of my Venice book. And 
in the original raw file, she was almost completely black because it's backlit and, and it's just, and, and the snake also like very little visible detail. But in post, I extracted all the detail from the shadows, but I made sure that it looked, still looked, you know, somewhat natural, that it was, it didn't look like it was completely uh, fake and, and so on. So I think it's, the judgment is really making sure that, that it still looks like it wasn't too manipulated, that it looks like it, it's, it's photojournalistically accurate. And sometimes you need to take a break. Uh, you know, you, you need to do it to the best you can and to the best of your ability. And then, you know, go get a cup of coffee or wait a day and, and then look at it again. And then, because sometimes I lose track, like I, I'll be processing and I don't know anymore if it has gone too far or not. But if I look at it a couple hours later, I know immediately, like I, somehow it just hits me in the face. So that's also helpful is to wait a little, you know, do it, wait a little bit, decide, and then maybe take it down a notch. Um, but I, I like to take it all the way up to, to kind of maximum effect that I can get, because why not? You know, you, you want to hit people with something that they don't normally see you want you want you want something that will be you know surprising and and uh, uh that will be interesting so um yeah I, I, pro processing i think is a great thing i and by the way the, the opposite mistake that people make is not to process because some people get intimidated by the software or they get you know they, they they don't have the time for it or whatever and they just post unprocessed images and i think that's a huge missed opportunity you can almost always make an image better at design information or moment uh, by, by processing it at least a little bit so um highly recommend processing if you're not awesome doing it. awesome process away <laughs> Well, but not Jonathan, too much. I want to thank you. Not too much. Not too much. Just the right amount. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, Dotan, I really want to thank you for being here. It's always, you know, wonderful when you're here. You always bless us with a ton thank of you. wonderful information, you know, things to think about. Um, you know, one of the one of the big things, and I think you just said it kind of towards the end here, that I've taken away from this is just slow down. You know, everyone is, right. everyone's always in a rush and always, you know, quick to, to get the image, you know, get it in there, get it processed, get it over to, you know, social media or whatever it is, right. you know, take a second, breathe, yeah. relax. Yeah. yeah I, to, to, to add to that, you know, I've had instances definitely in the past where i've rushed too much and i posted something and i've regretted it i was like oh my god it didn't do that well but what was i thinking it's not that great an image now i realize now two weeks later that it's not that great an image uh, but on the on the opposite side of this not posting something will you'll never be you know you'll never kick yourself for not having posted something earlier you can always it's always pays to wait until you're sure that this is the image that you want to be known for uh, so, you know, in doubt, just wait. <laughs> That's it. Well, thank you so much for being here again. Thanks to everybody at home so who welcome. joined us and spent the last hour with us. We appreciate you as well. Uh, you know, definitely not the last time we're going to see Dotan here. I have a feeling we'll see him back shortly. Hopefully, you know, when, when we can squeeze him in and he's not out there, you know, traversing the streets of, of California or, you know, teaching some seminars. So definitely make sure to check him out. Uh, but thanks again, Dotan. We appreciate it. To everybody at home, we appreciate you. This is another rendition of the DNH Virtual Event Space. And we'll catch you next time.